Let's start it. Okay, so uh, we are we are talking about renormalization of QED, and we have done the first thing done, and we spent a lot of time developing calculational techniques, right? How to compute the loop diagrams, how to do the regularization, and we have experienced at least three different regularization, right? Hard cutoff, we talked about it in the context of fight to the Q theory, and then we did uh, Pauli Villars. Um, and then we also saw conventional regularization. Okay. And then we talked about renormalization mostly so far in terms of uh, what is called the own shell for the identity, meaning it's observable. We and then we fit the parameter that's observable. And then we are asking, you know, uh, sharp predictions, finite predictions among the observables. Okay, so we are we started talking about the second one, which is the vortex renormalization. So uh, clearly, so we're talking about QED. So QED actually is this. And then for me and part, finally, there is an interaction. So uh, this part, obviously, this corresponds to propagator of a photon and the relevant diagram, loop diagram, which is uh, vacuum polarization, which have done it. But then, uh, right now, we're talking about this one, which has, uh, say, photon and then an electron. Okay, and the relevant diagram that we will study today is this. Okay, so that's the vertex uh, regularization. Uh, here, we saw charge renormalization. Okay, so that was a certain observable, or in a, in a, in a more uh, uh, concrete sense, basically, we were asking. You know, if I look at the potential probed or, or sensed by the two charges, which comes from the mediation of the photon and there's a loop correction, how does that change uh, the potential strength as a function of energy scale? So that was a sharp uh, observable that we used to do the renormalization. And then here we are, we are talking about magnetic, but we will talk more, magnetic dipole moment. Okay, of the electron. So there's a certain something called magnetic dipole moment, which we will define <clears throat> study more carefully. But before that, let's even anticipate what we are going to see. So this term, on the other hand, describes propagation of electron. So at three level, obviously we have this, and then the loop diagram that we will look at is this. Okay, so here, uh, so this will be the last part that we'll talk about uh, in the context of renormalization of the QED. And then once we have all of that, eventually we will look at the global picture, what we're talking about. So let's go back to this, and then uh, let's talk about it. So last time, I showed you that, uh, so starting from the Dirac equation, so this is Dirac equation in the presence of coupling to, in the presence of coupling to uh, a photon, like so. And then, um, oh, this is not an equation, equate to zero. So now it's the equation. And last time I show you that this equation by multiplying as usual. Yes. This turns you to square M. And then two, which you can do complete exercise. The only thing you need to do is basically using a symmetrization and anti symmetrization of the gamma matrices that we are doing. You have a product of them. Okay, and then this, and you know, Fermion is zero. So this is the equation of the motion in the presence of coupling with the photon. And obviously, you can reduce back down to the free equation if you set photon to the zero, as you expect. Versus, on the other hand, uh, if you look at the equation for scalar charge of the photon, let's say you get this. So in this case, unlike in the case of three fermion, which uh, you get the exactly same klein burden equation as in the scalar, but in the presence of coupling to the photon, now there's a difference between the spin zero versus the spin two, a spin half. Okay? And in particular, this term is crucial, and then we're going to use up this term a lot today. Okay, so what, what, what's the meaning of this term? So that's the question, right? 
What is the physical meaning of this term? Uh, and you can explore, by the way, what is the sigma mu nu? Right, nu? Probably this way. Oh, I, like that. And then the Lorentz generator that acts on the spin hat field was given by this. Let me confirm in case you care, factors of I uh, and F. Okay, so uh, you can express, you can uh, first of all uh, get the concrete expression this in terms of electric and magnetic field, and then uh, these generators. So if you do so, let me just write this term only. So if you express using concrete representation, for instance, using in this case, vial representation, so expression of the gamma matrix using the vial representation, you can just get this expression, which I talked about last time, and you get, so this part becomes minus E, excuse me, times E field, E field times sigma, which is uh, twice of skin operator of the premium, this. So this extra term that appears in the case of a spinet field therefore describes a coupling between magnetic field to the spin of the fermion. And from this picture, it's clear now why, in the case of scalar, you did not have this, right? Because this guy has a spin zero, so this coupling dropped out. Okay. Now let's move on a, a little bit further from this. So uh, in non-relativistic, quantum mechanics. So if you write down Schrodinger equation, in the presence of external magnetic field, okay, this is just to remind you that in this case, you use the Hamiltonian, which is the usual kinetic term, and then potential. And since I couple the system to external magnetic field, there's extra interaction to, to the magnetic field. And that thing is given by B times, so B couples either angular momentum of the system, say you're talking about hydrogen atom, for instance. So you could you pick up hydrogen atom and you put that thing in the external magnetic field, then there's this interaction. But also, if uh, there is an intrinsic spin, you can also couple to that. Okay, because both behave as a dipole. So if you have a dipole, dipole can couple to a uh, uh, magnetic field. But then uh, you can, in principle, introduce a parameter that tells you the relative strength of the coupling between the angular momentum piece and the intrinsic spin piece to the uh, magnetic field. Okay, so that is G factor. And then there's overall strength of the, of the coupling between these two. And that is given by I wrote down this or magnet on. And then UV is given by E over 20. So, so here, uh, G factor is what we concern here, and then we will discuss. So, the point here that I want to try to make is that starting from fully relativistic uh, Dirac equation, this equation includes this possible effect between the coupling of the spin to the magnetic field. And then easy way to extract a piece is by looking at this carefully and understand how we might reduce to that. One way of doing it is that you just take the fully non-relativistic limit and then reduce to a shredding looking equation. Okay, just read it down. Okay, so there's one exercise we can do. Here, uh, let's do a chip exercise, which I found it a nice thing to do. So from here, Remember, this D include two terms, right? So D include uh, time derivative uh, minus or plus uh, E double third I. Um, this case minus and then spatial plot. And then you can replace this with I times Hamiltonian, this with I times momentum. Okay, if you go to the momentum space. So let's pass on to the momentum space, and then let's literally divide by one over two m. 
Okay, so what, again, let me say that again. I'm just gonna take this. And then notice the fact that this has this component, one include a Hamiltonian, the other includes a um, momentum, if you go to the momentum space, and then it's just uh, you know, literally divided by 2m. If you do so, you should get the following answer. <clears throat> okay, so this, I mean, I'll say, Really correct way of doing it is actually taking full non relativity limit carefully, but uh, this at least provide you a cheap way of, of cheating it. Acting on the side. So, so these exercises uh, allow you to extract a G factor from this relativistic equation. So suppose if I take the relativistic limit, this uh, you know, brings down to linear order in Hamiltonian, okay? By just extending it. So then this looks like P squared over 2M. So in this basis, meaning in this normalization, here is the V dot S term. We normalize with E over 2M, and then whatever that multiplies that factor was meant to be interpreted as G factor. So this exercise shows that show you that Dirac equation or Dirac theory of fermion predicts the fact that the G factor should be two at leading order. Okay, so G factor means the relative strength of the coupling of orbital angular momentum to the magnetic field versus the spin to the angular sorry external magnetic field. Uh, has a factor of two between the two, and at leading order in QED, relativist theory makes a prediction that it should be two. And uh, historically, the measurement of that came out to be very close to being two. Now the question is, now the question is, uh, how do we did, how do we connect that you know, observable in terms of this language? Okay, and then we're gonna now uh, jump into that one. Okay, good. So let's connect, let's connect this to those diagrams. Okay, so uh, you see, super nicely, you know, the right equation you obtain by, you know, taking derivative with respect to the sidewalk, if you remember, right? So starting from the Lagrangian, which had a side to side, sometimes you had a nil, sometimes you had a derivative, you took a derivative respect to psi bar. So the fact that you get this sort of thing in the equations of motion level means that, first of all, it's as if. It's as if there was a term in the Lagrangian, okay, that had something like, so here let me just use C. Okay, this is just the crude conceptual point that I'm making here. Um, it's like I had a psi bar, G, and then E over 2M, V dot S, so it's as if it had a, this sort of a, a term in it. Okay, since that if you take the derivative with respect to psi bar, you just get that, that was part of the term, right? Included in the equations function. Okay, so as if like that. Also, second point I want to make is that this term is not meant to be interpreted as electric dipole moment as opposed to being magnetic dipole moment. I think I said the last time, this particular combination or work really. This particular combination is dictated by the Lorentz variance because if you boost it, this turns into better vice versa. So this combination has to be combined like that. Okay, so now we are actually talking about, let's talk about relativistic uh, version of any equation so far. Okay, good. So now uh, that the first step we can we, we do that may start from here. So this equation came from that equation, literally, right? So that is this divided by 2m, because I, I did that, okay? Which means that, uh, which means that, you know, if I divide by this 2m versus that particular term to tell, um, so, 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 okay, so this can be rewritten in terms of that if I handle two, uh, 
e over 2, and then 1 over 2n. And then if I had f mu nu, sigma mu nu, psi. And then we said that, oh, it should have 2. The g factor should be 2 in this basis, in this expression. So if I rewrite this in terms of uh, a, uh, so it should be 2. And then, okay, first of all, let me, let me say it's a slightly different way. So this, this doesn't give us very precise expression. There's e over 4m, f mu nu, this. So in this uh, expression, which exactly corresponds to this expression, uh, this includes g factor, which corresponds to 2. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, this language then uh, allowed us to talk about the following thing. So in terms of original, original equation of motion, so let me make this statement sharper. The d mu square, m square, which I'm writing there. And g factor came from this term. So what I meant was there was a g factor, which is meant to be numerically two at true level. But in order to get this equation of motion, which is that equation of motion, it should be e over 4, because I have a two, I put 2 by hand. And then f mu nu, sigma mu nu. All right, and then once again, just to build up the uh, intuition, this is like saying that in the Lagrangian, there's as if as if there's interaction which goes like a g times p over four, and then psi bar sigma mu nu psi f mu. So it's as if in the Lagrangian there there's interaction between the photon and then fermion of this sort of form. Um, but you see that no matter what you do, the, the form of the interaction has the following structure. The form of the interaction has the following structure, which is so that interaction involves a pair of fermion, okay, and then there's a one photon. So the structure of the interaction has this. There's the one electron comes in. Electron comes out, there's a photon. Okay? So even though it's not clear, uh, this should come from this because I don't have anything else but you know that interaction in, in the original QED, uh, QED like right here. So at leading order, what do you have? At leading order, this thing has this diagram. Okay, as we draw before. So let's label. So this is like I call Q1 momentum, Q2. And then let's give p. And then there's going to be corrections. So that let me call either radiative correction or loop corrections, which we'll talk about. But let's first understand from this diagram how can we find such a term is the you know hiding inside of that. So let's first talk about that. And then after that we will talk about the radiative corrections. So this uh, amplitude, so suppose I let uh, external lag for photon, you know, uh, free, meaning I'm not going to write down the polarization vector associated with this external lag. Okay? And when I say that, I have in mind, for instance, I might attach this diagram like, into some external fermion too. So it is possible that this may not be only shell photons. Okay? So, so therefore, I will let this external lag free for now. Hence, my amplitude has explicit Lorentz in this mu associated with this, this mu. So this, at zero order level, or at three level, uh, has the following uh, final rule, minus i times e for the vertex and the gamma. And then there's a external fermion. I'm talking about, for instance, electron. OK, so this is the structure. OK, this was the final rule. Now you might say, oh, okay, so that's cool. This is right. But you know, from this expression, there's no chance to see, you know, this doesn't look at all like this. But on the other hand, I told you that some applications motion, which was derived in the presence of that interaction, must include this interaction precisely with the G factor equal to two. Okay? So let's first extract that. 
So in order to do that, we use uh, what is known as Gordon identity. And you will be asked to show it the former. Uh, so here we uh, assume that while the photon, this photon, did not be on shell. So in general, we learn it to be possibly off shell. On the other hand, we consider the fermion to be on shell. And then the physics behind this uh, is the following. So for instance, I can just apply external magnetic field. Applying external magnetic field is not like I'm shooting one on shell photon, okay? This is a background classical configuration, which can be thought of as a you know, collective configuration made of a lot of photons. So in any case, since I'm interested in since I'm interested in physics of having an external magnetic field applied to the system, so I let this external photon like to be possibly off shell, but I'm, then I'm, I'm shooting a fault, uh, electrons in their background and ask what happened to that electron. So for electron part, I'm, I'm demanding that they are on shell. And the Gordon identity that I'm about to write is valid when uh, photon spinners are on shell. Spinners are on shell, so that is consistent with the term that I'm posing. And the identity looks like u bar u2, uh, gamma mu, and then q1 is equal to So identity is about you know gamma mu sandwiched between two external photon, uh, sorry, the electron legs or spinner legs, which are only shell, is equal to that with a term with the you know sum of the two momenta divided by mass of the electron, and then this thing, okay, sigma mu n by four, and then you note that this piece q2 minus q1 is precisely p nu, which is the you know momentum transfer exerted on this photon. Okay, so now we start seeing the chance. So therefore, this is the zero order or three level amplitude now um, can be rewritten immediately as, okay, let me actually erase I, so I can just drop this I to so minus E. This. And then plus the minus. So there's a one over two M, there's an E, so in the minus, because I erase I that, and then um, I two sigma mu nu, T nu. Okay, so that's the amplitude. This should look very different from the original expression, but nevertheless, that's true, providing Fermi's evolution. So let's talk about each of the thermal events. The first term is saying that the way photon pair couples the photon is through their own momentum. That's this, this expression. Okay, the strength of the coupling of the uh, fermions to the photon is proportional to the momentum carried by those fermions. Okay. In fact, this is how scalars couple. So let's make a point, the first term. Uh, if you recall, in scalar QED, where scalar QED has the interaction between the scalars, uh, pair of scalar to the photon in the following form, minus, we can derive this from the covariant derivative as we talked about. This is, this is coupling between 
charge the scalar coupled to the, the photon. And then the final rule in this case, uh, you, you can extract, extract from this. Right, this. Say I, I, I have, I'm shooting in, say, why that called the electron, which is the particle uh, comes from this, this operator. And then I'm creating an electron with a photon, for instance. And then this final rule is minus I E gamma to not gamma. Obviously, there's a gap. And then if I call T1 momentum, T2 momentum, T1, mu, T2. So all I'm, all I'm trying to say here is that when we decompose gamma mu in terms of these two terms, according to the Gordon identity, the first term literally describes the contribution to the coupling of the fermion, which is the same as if scalar couples to the photon. Okay, it couples to the momentum, strength of the momentum. Okay, so that's the first comment. What about the second? Second is what we are interested in. So let's look at it. Okay, the second term is what we want. It says that secret, secretly, this is a three level diagram included this term. First of all, it has a sigma mu nu, as we wanted to see, and then it has a p nu, which is like a derivative, right? So uh, if we add in external polarization factor for the photon, like uh, this, oh, in this case, nu. So this, since this is anti-symmetrized, this is automatically anti-symmetrized, and the derivative acting on the polarization or derivative acting on the photon field is nothing but field strength. So this is literally giving you sigma mu nu at mu interaction. Okay? And so uh, if you work it out, including uh, factors of two and not, so uh, this therefore contribute to that. But in order to make a sharp connection to this observation, that's not the following. So this term, I'm writing the well, this term uh, should be written as we know it should be two, because G factor of the three level we found out to be two. So it should be two. And then um, it has, therefore, since I brought out the two, it should be um, E over 4m times minus i bar u2, sigma u0, u2. So the offset is the following. So this exercise is just to show that there is A, a contribution to the magnetic moment that we expect. Two, the way we can extract the G factor from this calculation is that suppose you are doing this uh, you know, general sub loop level calculation. So, right? Then the way you should expect is that you should, the G factor, therefore, is 4m over 2 times the coefficient. Coefficient of this factor minus u, c1 minus u. And so this is a prescription. So but in general, if you start including loop diagram, the way you can expect the g factor is again you compute that thing, and then you you look at the coefficient of whatever that multiplies that factor, but normalize or in units of e over four m. That's what I mean by dividing by or multiplying four m over two. So to expect that. Okay, so that's the prescription. Okay, so having settled down on the rules to extract the factor, now we can actually talk about uh, loop corrections. Any question? Okay. In fact, there is a nice structure that we want to talk about for this vertex diagram that I drew several times by now. So let's do it again. So Q1, Q2, and then Q2. So uh, suppose I call the, you know, this arbitrary diagram, which you again will include this, many, many uh, possible loop corrections, high-order corrections, whatever. 
can pop up on many, many, you know, diagrams, including many loops. But uh, the general, so, so if I call this to be I times M mu, since once again, I'm not specifying an external leg, I'm not multiplying the polarization yet. So this thing, uh, so there's a genuine structure of this object, which I'm, I'm about to discuss now. So this thing is a Lorentz vector value to amplitude, right? So this is Lorentz vector. And then you can ask, okay, let me try, let's just write down possible uh, you know, form of this function. That means that what are the available Lorentz factors in this question? Well, there are P mu, there's a Q1, Q2, and then there's a gamma mu. Okay, so these are, 4R seems to be, you know, the, the possible ingredient for us to construct a Lorentz valued amplitude. So we can write down as, for instance, some function f, uh, f1 and we call gamma mu, and then f2 b mu, f3 q1, f4 q2. Okay, so this seems to be maximally general. However, this is, these are not all, all uh, independent, first of all, uh, by momentum the conservation. Now the P mu is equal to Q2 minus Q1. Okay, so therefore, if you plug this in, what do you get? You get, so this all three term can be collapsed into instead. Um, let's see, what? Something that multiplies Q2, so uh, therefore, F2 plus F4 Q2. And then F3 minus F2 to one. Which means that uh, generically, you know, it's redundant to add this, uh, this second number. Or you can, put, you can eliminate any of the, any, of, any one of these three terms, that's, that's, that's the way, right? using, using the moment of conservation. So uh, therefore, we can, uh, after this, we can just parameterize as only, so, so I'm, I'm just going to drop it. I don't want to talk about that. So we can just parameterize in terms of three independent functions. And these functions, name of these functions are called form factors. I'm not done yet, because there's a more redundancy we can use to reduce. So what else we can say? Two. So uh, what are the possible arguments for these functions? So these functions, f of i, we are now have a three, or one, three, four, could depend on, in principle, uh, some Lorentz scalars. This is Lorentz scalar function. So you want to construct a Lorentz scalar, therefore the argument should be Lorentz scalar. But they are they should be made out of these things, right? So for the possible candidate, where you can have a p square p dot q one q two, uh, or q one slash or q two slash, and p two slash is redundant, okay, or class. Okay, so these are possible arguments for those uh, form factors. Um, however, since we are talking about only shell fermions, so for only shell, they say, so for instance, Q1 slash, which is the momentum of this electron that comes in, the UQ1 must solve the Kirchner's motion at three level, but also Q2 slash, when it is contracted to the left, should be equal to this. So again, it's going to be treated as motion. So what that means is that uh, if this form factor function had a Q, either Q1 or Q2, you can simply use the equations of motion to convert that into just dependence on the mass itself. Okay? So what they mean, what they show is that we don't have to keep you know, Q slash, Q2 slash as a separate argument because they're all equivalent to being just dependence on the masses. Okay. 
So, um, so therefore, now we are left with only a uh, few things. So uh, again, by momentum conservation, these two are not all independent. So the independent arguments should be, therefore, meaningful independent arguments of this one factor functions. Could be either you take q1 dot q2 and then mass or two. Or you can just trade this with p square, which has um, 2m squared minus 2 times q1 dot q2. Remember p, where is it? p is this. So if you square this, you have the q1 square, q2 square, which is 2m square, 2m square minus uh, this 2. So therefore this, and then m squared. So you can take either you know, form factor being function of these two variables, or just p squared and m squared. But also, on top of this, we want this to be a function of functions of dimension list argument. Because otherwise, if you have a dimension full argument, then you have to make sure you know, how does the dimension works. So in this case, you can just simply form a one dimension list argument, which is the ratio of these two. So this for m squared. So basically, at this point, we can just say that this form factor functions, which we have a three at this point, is just a function of a p square over m squared. And they normalize the rest by either powers of p square or just m squared. That's it. Last, that's not done yet, is a one more thing to be used to even reduce further the structure of that thing, which is word identity. So word identity says that if you have any uh, you know amplitude with the external photon line, and then if you replace polarization vector with the momentum of itself, it should be zero. So what that means is that if I do uh, p mu m mu, which in this case, if you want, I can throw in i that uh, I keep track of i correctly, you get the following. First of all, we you have oh I missed a very important thing here. You uh, are missing. Move R Q2, U Q1. Okay, otherwise all this discussion doesn't go through. Okay, sorry for that. Let me let me correct that again. The amplitude obviously must have the external uh, fermion lines, which are this U bar U, and then I'm saying internal structure can be this. So so therefore this thing has the following structure. So U bar Q2, and then I'm just contracting it to I2 again, which is F1. This much. Um, good. And then I have uh, uh, F3, P dot Q1, F4, P dot Q2, and then U of Q1. So let's look at this. So this is a certain, a certain one constraint, which means that this should give us one relationship among these three form factors, right? So we, so far we said that, oh, there seems to be three independent form factors, but word identity is a sharp condition that is relating these three form factors. So we should get only two independent form factor functions. That's the goal. But first of all, this piece, which is a sandwich between, so number one, Q2, K slash, Q1. Well, this is, on the other hand, Q2 slash minus Q1 slash. So if Q2 slash, you know, uh, multiply to the left, they give you n times product of these two. So Q1 slash multiply to the right also give you n times product of these two. Okay? So this gives you zero. I literally use the previous one. That's all I need. Okay? Good. So that the first term is literally zero. So that doesn't give us a, a constraint. What about the other two? So let's just uh, do it. Um, so this is equal to what? Uh, this give you q2 dot q1 minus q1 uh, squared, which is q2 dot q1 minus m squared. What about q dot 
So P by Q2, the last term. So this time I'm getting M squared minus Q1 by Q2. So you see that um, this shows that P dot Q1 is minus of P dot Q2. Right? So so therefore, word identity set is that zero should be equal to the first term with zero, as we talked about, um, is u bar q2. And then we get what, like f3 minus f4 times p dot q1 for generic momenta, and then u of q1. And you can satisfy this uh, condition, which is you know dictated by the gauge invariance. Therefore, this shows that F3 should always be the same function as F4. Okay, so effectively we are left with two functions. Okay, so that's cool enough. <clears throat> By the way, uh, so far discussion is regardless of the internal diagram, right? So this whole they're hoping in all orders important. Okay, I have not used anything about specific diagrams. So this is true uh, in all orders important vision theory. So we said that we don't have to include this, and then we said that this should be the same as F3. So far, that's what we have said. And then this thing, all a form factor function is only a function of a p square over n square. That's all this set of. Okay, so let's clean up. Um, therefore, we have f1, m on u, plus what? f3, and then we have q1 plus q2 mu. But then we have a Gordon identity. Okay, so Gordon identity that I introduced earlier, you can use it to rewrite the second term in a slightly more useful form. So this should be equal to this, right? Explicitly, and then I'm going to write the, uh, the final answer. So, so Gordon identity says that this should be equal to two m times you are gamma middle. That's the first piece. And then I times um, this is minus mu. Okay, so what's the point here? Okay, so this is almost a final form. So instead of using either gamma mu and then sum of the momenta, but Gordon identity give you either get some of the momentum can be expressed in terms of gamma mu and the sigma mu or vice versa. You can trade. So you can choose to pick any of these two from your writing your expression, right? So we can decide to write the form as a final form. Picking one is the gamma mu, which I will explain why that's useful, and the second is the sigma mu. Okay? So if you decide to do so, uh, it's a general vertex diagram can be always written as this form, and then I will explain. Now you can just literally plug in the solution. There's a long form factor, which will be some combination of F1, F2 here, F3 here, which is only function of this row F square in the gamma mu. So this is the final expression. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's wrap up what we have done so far. So we said that there, we argue that the general, uh, in this case, carry invariant theory like QED because. In any of this discussion, I did not mention anything about uh, sigma phi. So I assume that theory is a very variant. And then 
any diagram in all the recent motivation theory can always be recasted in this following form. The first term being proportional to gamma mu, the second term being proportional to this combination, sigma mu nu p mu. What are two <coughs> with the mere normalization? Why, why did I say it just a, a, a normalization? Well, this is dimension. So, so, so this, if you want, is a dimensionless quantity. Then, if I put p mu, this has dimension one. So, in order to get the same dimensionless function, you divide it by dimension full parameter. In this case, the best candidate is massive vector. Okay, that's how I've done. And the two, because that's useful and later on. That's all there is, but, but really the point is that it has a you know, gamma mu piece and sigma mu nu p mu piece. And we talked about, well, this piece, gamma mu piece is literally, you know, uh, whenever we see, whenever we see some you know, non trivial value for F1, that is related to this piece, which therefore is related to the charge. Okay, later on. And then the second piece, second piece is this, which is uh, related to sigma mu nu psi half mu nu. In this case, we normalize to be one over two f, for instance. So this is a magnetic moment piece. This is a charge coupling piece. Okay, so, so, so there you see why this is useful, where now whenever you compare something in a recast in this form, you can immediately read it off. What is the effect of a loop correction to the charge, or more precisely, charge renormalization? And then what is the effect of the loop diagrams to the corrections to the uh, magnetic dipole moment? Okay, so in this sense, this is a good basis to extract uh, any physical implications. Questions. Okay, so let me make it sharper now, and then we're going to talk about diagonal computation. I'm not going to compute this one, um, because we have done a lot of computation, and you know all the techniques. So now I, I feel more comfortable to just ask you to the computation. So at leading order, recall, by leading order, I mean tree level. We found out that you know f1 is one, f2 is equal to zero, right? So we, we literally write down the final rules for this in this basis. We only had a this with a one here, because that's what I pulled down minus IE vector. Okay, so this is to be normalized against the trivial quantity, and then we did not have any this piece. Let me make sure. When I say we did not have this piece uh, in this basis. Obviously, we had the effect of this term by rewriting this in terms of going backward, right? In terms of using the word identity. So, when I say this in that particular basis, but also note that a leading order saying G factor was two. That's what we showed. Okay? Therefore, you know, uh, G factor. Um, in general, is given by the following. The G factor is given by two, which you should be there, even without any corrections to the F2 function, times uh, two of F2 is squared of M squared. So let's understand this uh, factors of two. Uh, remember, we said that you know, in order to extract the G factor, what you have to do is that you have to look at you know coefficient of this factor, sigma mu nu p nu u u bar of two factors of minus i. And then I said that you have to multiply by 4m over e. So in units of e over 4m, the free factor that multiplies this particular combination was g factor. So this thing has an e over 2m. Okay, so if you multiply that factor, you get the factor of two. And also, so this is a general momentum dependent G factor. So if you want to know how does the uh, magnetic moment changes as you change the energy scale of the physics, this is the exact expression. Um, however, uh, experimentally,
the magnetic moment merger, uh, measured at, you know, almost a stifling, meaning with the external moment can be much, much smaller than the uh, electron mass scale. So, so there is good to take a limit where G factor is approximately at really a low energy static limit, basically two plus two times F to evaluate with a field. So I'm just literally taking this. Okay, so we're gonna use this as our proxy to the G factor. And probably you have a heard G minus two, like electron G minus two, mu on G minus two, and uh, uh, there is an ongoing, you know, um, discussions in the literature. So for instance, instead of electron, now if you look at the muon, there's a blob, the muon coming in, muon coming out, and then this has been measured at very high precision. And then people have done this you know, high precision calculation, not only computing this single diagram that we are gonna talk about, okay? They talked about a lot of corrections, like four loops, including QCD corrections, all crazy, crazy high precision calculations. So people have done, you know, live devoid calculation for this. And then, um, and then people also measure, like good experimentalists measure this. And then there's a difference between theoretical calculation within the standard model and the actual uh, experimental observation made as of today to speak. And there's a deviation, and deviation is almost of the order of five sigma. So statistically, when you see a deviation of the order of five sigma, we say that there is a definite scientific difference between the two, which means the standard model may not be the correct theory describing that observation. So there are both uh, uh, you know, activities trying to understand you know, whether there has been any mistake or inconsistency made in, in the process of measurement itself, but also as a theorist, whether we can think about possibly new theories that explains that deviation. It's called the uh, mu and g minus two. Okay, why g minus two? Basically just focusing on this piece. Okay, this piece is two. Okay. All right, so that's uh, that's all for all I want to say about setting up this discussion. And then now uh, we can talk about What about electron g minus two? There is echo of uh, measurement one too. Uh, um, it is, uh, as far as I remember, it is a less precise compared to the mu of g minus two. Uh, one of the reasons, well, muon is much heavier than electron. And then, uh, um, so uh, lighter the fermion or charge the particle, it's easier to radiate and it, it's harder to control. So muon is better, uh, but then you might say, well, what about the tau one? It's even heavier, but, but the price you have to pay is that tau one is unstable. So it's just decay away to something else. So you want to have a heavy but somewhat stable uh, charge the particle to, to play this game. Well, there is a certain measurement I think is done for electron, electron G minus two, and there's also a plan to have a more improved observation of the electron G minus two. So this is very important because if this is a mu G minus is a real new physics, okay, you can ask, okay, does that new physics, whatever happened in this plot, they couple to the mu one, also couples to the electron? If so, in what form? If not, we are talking about what is known as a left and universality violation. A certain new physics that only the light mu one and dislike electron. Okay, that's not there. It's called the left universality violation. So it can be one playground to test whether such a thing exists. Or not. <clears throat> so even though. Um, if you want to contribute to this community, this this uh, part of the physics in the world, uh, there are many aspects, right? What about the hadronic corrections to that? What about higher loop calculation to that, which which requires designated training to be so? But as a if you wish as a BSA model builder, for instance, okay, if you want to cook up or build up your own sort of theory, reasonable theory that can possibly explain this discrepancy, then one loop calculation that we are about to talk about is almost all you need to know to be able to think about possibly new theories to, to you know, explain this, um, this what is called anomaly. Okay, so let's compute. Well, let's pretend to compute for which you actually compute.
So uh, we, we are looking for a corrections to this. There's a three, and then let's see, what are the possible loop diagrams? Well, first of all, I'm talking about, you know, this is order E. And then on top of this uh, original vertex, this has uh, extra E square. So I'm talking about E square corrections to the lead. Okay, let's see that the two vertices. So another diagram you can, you can look for is this. But also eventually, you have this. <clears throat> so at one loop level, this might be all we have. Okay, two loop, you may have much more, way more of any diagrams to talk about. So the first point I want to make is that these three, the claim is only modifies or corrects corrects uh, not only but uh, uh, it's fair to say that it only affects the gamma u term uh, of, of this thing that we talked about, right? So this thing had a gamma mu f1 plus sigma mu p2 f2 with some stuff. What I'm saying is this three, first three, only corrects the gamma mu. And so this thing is what we want, therefore this will contribute. A sigma mu new term. But not only is a sigma mu new, but it also actually contributes to the gamma mu term, as you will see. But so this one, we can just wait to see why, why this is the case. But this one, you might say, okay, well, how, how do we see that? Okay, how do we know, even before computing this thing, we know that this only corrects the gamma of the term. So let's talk about that quickly before we move on to this. Okay, so uh, why do I say this, first of all? Um, if you look at this, this is effectively like product of this times trillion vertex, okay? And this is like this modified electron propagator times trillion vertex, and this too, this is outgoing electron propagator times vertex. So this day, there's no way you can call to say that it, it, it only corrects the external propagator. This is a genuine correction to the vertex itself, okay? Mm -hmm. So therefore this thing, uh, just to give you a big picture thing, for instance, the first one, this thing, one of the effect of this thing will be, like if I had F mu nu, F mu nu, original kinetic term, we will have a slightly more systematic discussion about what I'm about to say, uh, perhaps in two lectures, probably last lecture. But for now, let me give you, uh, you know, at least a big picture, a rough picture, why this is true. So one of the corrects, so, so, so original propagator plus this loop correction is to modify this in such a way that uh, instead of uh, having an F mu, F mu with a one times one over first, you will get some corrections, which is like in the form of, uh, uh, let me say, one plus something of this thing. So I can just roughly say that, okay, just combine these two things, let me just call Z, so A, F mu, F mu. So one of the effects of that thing is to modify the normalization of this kinetic term, okay? We'll make it slightly more precise. So then you might say, okay, why then uh, did I say that this only corrects the gamma mu? It only actually corrects the photon kinetic term, right? However, you may recall that last time when we talked about this, we actually talked about the renormalization of electric charge, and we even derived how does electric charge changes as a function of energy. We even derived renormalization group equation. So you might say, okay, how does that actually, uh, you know, result in the correction to the electric charge? And that comes from the following facts. So, so for instance, uh, now I, let me include. So interactions, let me do interaction. Okay. 
Now, uh, I would like to have a you know uh, uh, expression where or normalization where a list kinetic term is canonically normalized. Okay, so by canonically normalized, I mean I want to see that f mu nu, f mu nu, and that comes with a one times minus one form. Okay, that's the canonically normalized. But after correcting or adding the loop correction, it comes out not to be canonically normalized. So therefore, you can do uh, what is known as a wave function. Although this is not really actually a wave function, you can do wave function renormalization. Basically, the motivation being to have, again, canonically normalized normalized kinetic term. And how can you do that? Well, you can just uh, define, you know, scale root of the ZA times original Holcomb field, you don't call it a new field. Say I put R to say it's a renormalized. Okay, so if you do it, then you should get now this thing is virtually normalized, but in terms of new field, once again I call renormalized Holcomb field. Okay. But then you want to renormalize everything. So you want to uh, pick the single normalized field. So you have to do it here. Then if you do it, you have to do the following. So you divide by this thing and then multiply by that thing. So now this is renormalized bottom field. Oh, the bottom again, sorry, the bottom field again. So you see that the, the actual effect of modifying the normalization of kinetic, which comes from this uh, a vacuum polarization diagram, it's actually modify what you call to be charged before. Okay, so that's how you see that this first, first, uh, for instance, this diagram actually modifies the gamma neutral, which is exactly the charge. Okay. What about what about the electron, which we will talk about uh, so in, in more detail, but let's already anticipate. So in addition to the this electron line, suppose I have included a loop diagram. Yeah, that doesn't be very nice loop diagram. It is perfect. Let me try it. That's it. Way better. Five million times better. So now you, you can see what this will do for you. So this will do instead of now this. This now uh, you give one plus delta psi, okay, so loop correction. One of the effects, and then there's other effects. We will, we will talk about it in detail uh, later, but one of the effects, maybe I'll talk about today if we go well today. No, <laughs> one of the effects of that diagram will be, it will have this correction, overall change of normalization of the of permanent. So once again, let me just call this to, to be uh, z of psi. Then once again, you want to have a canonically normalized kinetic term, right? So again, you do it, how? Scale root of the z of psi, psi, you call it a renormalized term. Yeah. So, so then, uh, you see, I a slash one, let me just write. Oh no, that's illegal expression. That's illegal expression. So if you do it, then uh, you should get now you normalize the kinetic term. Then you see I e uh, divided by z of psi normalized. So if you want to combine, you know, renormalization of a both vector polarization of photon and then electron self energy, then in addition to this. You will also have scale root of the zero a, right? So if you have both of both of it together. So that's the sense I said that these three first diagrams are literally just you know using improved drastic propagator for external x. Okay, instead of using three propagators, I'm just using improved drastic propagator that is that and then those, those effect only corrects the gamma neutron or charge of 
Okay, so now with that, uh, we will now focus on this. Day. Any questions? Yes. I'm curious about why you are using, why you are interested in some diagrams with root in external line. Why we are interested in? Good. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I'm confused about it because we we run about LSG and good. I I guess we are yeah we don't need to care about it. Uh, I, I yeah. It, but that's, good. Good. No, that that's an important question. Yeah. So let me answer. Um. So, uh, naively, suppose you you have not learned high tech. High tech. By high tech, I mean. Um, there's things called the one PI effective action and this stuff like that. Okay, so so high high level version of a generating functional that we didn't have much time to talk about, unfortunately. Um, suppose we did not learn any of that at high tech. That without those uh, more advanced uh, uh, concepts, that if if I have to worry about this this diagram, then generically I will have to include all of these uh, loops, right? At the level of Lagrangian picture. If I want to compute this, and then I, I want to start including loop diagrams and order, uh, you know, O to the E cube, certainly they they make a contribution to that. So without learning better way of organizing um, the renormalization, pro uh, uh, renormalization procedure and better way of thinking about it, or higher, you know, improve the version of a LEC reduction formula, I will have to include those. But that's the beginning point. So I'm talking about, so we have to do it. However, ultimately, there is a better way of organizing renormalization. And let me just say the statement. Better way of organizing renormalization is that we, you just look at what is known as a one PI vertex. One PI vertex means that it is a one particle irreducible vertex. For instance, this is not a one PI irreducible vertex because you can cut internal line and they are separated. Okay, this one too, this one too. So probably your question came from that insight that uh, uh, so the fully generalized systematic way of doing renormalization is that you only look at the one PI diagrams one by one separately. So in this case, I'm just gonna worry about propagators. Don't ask me about the vertices. I'm gonna just work about this propagator. Don't ask, don't ask me anything else. So we just look, at, you know, study the renormalization of this, and then I'm just gonna work on, work on just the vertices and everything cut out. Okay. Entire external legs are cut out because I'm only looking at the one PI. Then you just assemble completely renormalize the one PI vertices to, to start forming a general diagrams. Okay, so that's the sense you're right in the sense that we don't, this may be redundant way of thinking about it. But the reason why I presented this was because, well, you don't, you don't know that that will improve the precision yet. So you have to start from here. I got it. Good. Any other questions? Yes. Well, why did you only care about wave function renormalization model from this and chart? Good. So that's obviously frank and important question. So I just put on the log of this this word. I said that one of the effects is this, and there are other, but I'm not gonna tell you now. But we will have to talk about it more systematically. Yes, there are there are mass renormalization, but I just wanted to focus on. Well, so that only press this, not not uh, not the magnetic moment also. But so fuller is full is, uh, answer to that question indeed requires to know about uh, mass renormalization. But I just wanted to simplify this question because that I so now I have opened the entire box. Talk about what you are. Any other questions? Okay, good. So now let's look at the diagram. Okay, so let's look at the diagram. 
is Q1, Q2. Um, just so that I don't mess up, let me just follow K. That I call this to be P, so this should be K plus P. Look at this. So I have a clockwise blue. That should be K by M. One by one minute the duration. So let me call this to be R times MU2. Um, Y2. Okay. <laughs> you can see that's so. so. So you should now you should be able to write down this amplitude. So I'm just gonna write the bare amplitude, and then I'm just gonna you know sketch a couple of key points to be discussed. But the rest I will ask you to fill out. So uh, let me use here final engage for the photon propagator. Lima to engage to the photon propagator. So then the photon propagator has G nu alpha. So here the structure is um, the Lorentz index is this leg is mu, and this, uh, guess what? I think I call this to be nu, this would be alpha. Okay? So that's the photon propagator. And then k minus q1 squared. Let me drop additional prescription for now. Just so that I, I don't have a very long expression. So now I'm following charge flow backward. So there's a u bar. I'm going to hit the first gamma nu. Good. And then I get, I have this photon, uh, sorry, the, the fermion propagator. Again, I'm dropping the I use one prescription for now. And then I hit that vertex, which is gamma mu. Then I will have to come back with that of uh, electron propagators, a square minus m square. I have a square plus m. And then I end with a gamma alpha. And then finally, Skinner, so incoming electron. So this is the amplitude. Good. So this thing has uh, three terms in the propagator. So in the denominator, so there's this, there's that, there's that. So just to sketch, one, this thing has a structure of k times b times c. So you know what, how to re rewrite this in terms of final parameterization. And I explained to you one of the key reasons to do final parameterization is because otherwise you wouldn't know how to do the big rotation. Okay, so all the standard of poles you just collect to the two and pole. Okay, and then you can do the rotation. So you do it. And then after do, doing this, now denominator, if you do that, denominator uh, has a structure of the following form. So, so then uh, if you do it, uh, you have a denominator of this form, set C to the Q, so that's the denominator. And then, um, so this thing has the following structure. So K plus Y P, Q1 squared minus delta plus I is one Q. Okay, and then this thing has a sum uh, expression. I'm not sure if it's necessary to write, but anyway, it has a sum expression, concrete expression, for one case. Okay. So as usual, once you have this, that you can do the change of variable, right? You now you just call this to be your new variable k prime. Say you did it. Then your, your, the only reason why I'm following this, at least to show you the steps so that in your head, okay, internally, you know how, how things go, what, what is going on. So if you do it, uh, then numerator, so the numerator has this uh, G mu new thing, gamma, 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 and then in between them, these are two factors. And then two spinner factors. Okay, the spinner factor we can factor out for now. So numerator uh, is given by half of the numerator, so this is numerator, uh, has a structure that there is a very complicated expression, but I don't care because there's a very complicated expression, which is gamma mu term, which you're not super interested in. And then what I'm interested in is that you do the terms. That 
you know. Oh, yeah, so that's really an interesting term. And then finally, Okay, so numerator is like that. Now, uh, the first term, I don't care, because that's, you know, oops. eventually we have to care, but for now, I don't care, because that's the gamma you know, and it should, correct, you know, it should uh, uh, contribute to the charge of normalization effectively. Um, so this is what we are interested in. So we will keep it and compute it. And then what about this? This is something new. And then according to this general discussion that holds in all, all our simple theory, we expect that to have only to see these two terms. Well, where they come from, right? This is not what we were expecting. Um, however, this term, the final, this term makes a zero contribution eventually. And why is that? Let me just quickly expand, explain. So when you do the final parameterization, this thing has two times, like dx, dy, dz, everything comes, goes from zero to one, and there's a delta function, first get everything out to one, and then you know you have this xa here. Okay, so one thing that I want to point out is that a this piece is a symmetric under exchange of x and y. Okay, obviously, if you change x and y, x and y nothing changes, total complete symmetric, right? In x and y, but also this overall denominator that I show you here, good, good that I wrote down this, this thing. Um, the only now x and y dependence after change of variable is encoded in this delta, capital delta, okay? And this capital delta is also symmetric in the exchange of x and y, okay? So if you rewrite x into the y and the y, you call it an x, this is symmetric, that thing is symmetric, so everything is symmetric under the exchange of x and y. However, this piece is anti-symmetric in exchange of x and y, hence that makes a zero contribution. Okay, good. So therefore, we are left with these two, and then we're only kind of focus on this piece because that, once again, is important. But 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 that's not uh, um, what I want to know at least for now. Okay, good. So uh, let me then write down only the terms that I'm interested in. So n two mu which has uh, this entire piece, which I can just take it out of. There's a P mu, P bar, mu two, C one mu nu, mu one, good. And then um, I have times, I have the following expression. So if you're doing the math, you should get this. Then the k squared minus delta plus x one to the cube. Oh, I, I sorry, I forgot. D four k, and then z one minus z, and then other point one come from. Okay, and um, therefore, if you recall how we define a. Uh, how we define um, the form factors. So let, let me recall you. Maybe if we get that expression. So, so we said that the general amplitude can be phrased into minus IE times U uh, bar. Let me just write two to say the Q2. And then f1 function times gamma mu, and then i sigma mu nu over 2m d mu uh, f2 function mu1. So if you compare this expression, then you should be able to extract extract uh, f2, the form factor. Okay. So therefore, form factor is given by. I'm gonna erase all stuff because I don't want to rewrite everything again. Uh, is this entire uh, integral 
basically, you see, there's a P nu sigma mu nu, P nu sigma mu nu. And then this thing becomes minus i times i, which is e, so e over 2m. The only difference between you know, this, uh, basically, you should be dividing by e over 2m to extract f. So f2 is literally this thing times 2m over e. Okay? If you just literally compare. So, therefore, uh, let me erase this. So F2, the form factor that we're interested in for uh, magnetic moment is this. Okay, good. Now uh, let's actually look at it and compute it because that's easy to compute. Okay. So I think I should probably come to it real time. So before that, let me actually uh, mention, uh, uh, let me just do a little bit of a dimensional analysis first to see what you should expect. So the question is, sh I, should you be scared to see this or you should be, you should feel comfortable to see this? I don't know, you may always feel uncomfortable to see this. But let's let's check. At least let's check. Uh, so this thing is proportions. There's an e to the e square, so it goes like e square. Okay. So the form factor is modulo or, or, or the leading order of this. So it is e square correction two on top of you know order e as we organize that way. Right? And then this thing has an m square. But then I told you that the f two the form factor form, uh, form factor is a uh, dimensionless. So this is dimension zero. But then there is this uh, mass dimension two guy sitting, okay? And then rest is dimensionless parameter. So the only way you can get a dimension full factor to compensate this thing is from the momentum integral, right? So let's see. So this is a d4 to the k, which is a four power, and then d k squared to the cube. This is k to the cube. What did I say? k to the sixth. So this thing goes like, therefore, you know, the you know, UV structure of that, that thing is goes like this. So it is it goes like a one over lambda to the square. Hence, this integral, it looks scary and complicated, but this is the UV finite. Okay? So this is UV finite integral. We should be able to do it, and we're going to do it. Because that's good to do. Okay, good. So um, let's let's clean up, but let's the only thing that we need to know how to do it is basically d for k, k squared minus delta i into long q. So this is the integral that you need to know, which is u finite, that therefore you should not expect to uh, see any any shock by doing this. And I already gave you the most general expression, which is like i to the r as delta arbitrary dimension, but here we are doing the four dimension calculation. And then the definition of this thing was k squared to the r, k squared to the minus delta plus a to the long to the s. And then we derive an only expression for this, close the form. So if you look back and then just apply this, you should get this, this thing should be equal to minus i over 32 times square delta. And even before you actually do any calculation, even at this level, okay, what I could have uh, anticipated is the following. I know this is UV finite, that's factor number one. So, and then there, and then this should have a one over dimension square. And then the only, so you're integrating over the K, the only dimension full parameter is the delta. So we, I know that it should go like something like del, one over delta, which is dimension two. And then this is a loop integral. And I told you, this is a roughly goes like, 65 square. And there might be details of factors of i and then factors of two. Even i you can anticipate because you have to do the analytic continuation to the Euclidean space. When you do that, you know that you are thinking of the i. So up to minus two, you should have just write that as already. But detailed calculation will give you this. Done. All right, so then let's finish the calculation. 
So if I plug in now, and then, uh, then you should get the following expression. So F2, F to P square over M square. Uh, without an approximation yet. Uh, you get alpha over pi, where alpha is called the pi structure constant, which is E square over four pi. This is just the name. Okay, so people are lazy to write that E square over all the time. Let's write this way. And then M square. This is literally plugging everything. You get now delta. I'm just plugging expression for delta. Okay, so delta, the delta expression was uh, here before, but I erased. But I'm just going to write it again. It's going to be minus g squared m squared minus xy t squared. And then is that all my mistake? Okay, so this is now we only need to do find my primary integral. But it's not too bad because remember, at the end of the day, what we have to do is that g is two times, two plus two times f2 evaluated the zero, right? So we said that experimentally, the minimum is done at very low energy static limit. So we're going to just uh, drop this term. We set p to p, p, p squared to zero. Then you get a happy result because, first of all, First of all, uh, one minus c factor, one factor cancels out. Okay, that's good. The uh, m square factor here cancels against that. And so it's manifestly dimensionless, as you see now. Okay, so we just need to do this integral. Hence, uh, the thing that we have to do is literally uh, this integral, which is uh, dz dy. Dx, delta x plus y plus z minus one, and then z over one minus z. So this is the integral you have to do, and then times alpha over pi, right? That's what all you have to do. So let's do it because um, there's a, just one point that I want to show uh, that you should be careful. So now, first of all, there's a single delta function at x. You just say this is one, right? So providing that the center of this. Uh, lies inside of the range between zero and one, yes, this is one. Otherwise, zero, as you know. So uh, let's make a space, because that's the last thing that we need to do, then we'll be done. I mean, if you want, this is like if, uh, the, anyway, so, so let's do it. So, so, so if you do it, when you do the x integral, when you do x integral, uh, it, it gives you constraint on the possible range for y. Now let's see how that comes about. So, so that means, first of all, doing this integral means that I'm inversing x plus y plus z is equal to one, right? So that's what, doing that integration means. And then that's condition number one. Condition number two, y ranges from greater than zero, less than one, I mean, trivially for this. But then uh, x, I have to say, I say that uh, the center of this should lie between these two. I said that. So there, that means x is equal to, from the first, uh, first equation here, one minus this. And then this should be greater than zero, less than one. Okay? So let's first look at the this part, lower, lower part. Um, so what that means is this. And in terms of y, that tells you y should be less than one minus. Okay? The first this should hold. Okay? And then what about the second piece? Second piece tells you y should be greater than minus z, where z is always greater than zero less than one, greater than zero less than one. So you have to combine all these conditions, three conditions. But this is manifestly equal less than zero, right? So combining all of that, you see that after doing the first integration, the range of y should be uh, greater of these two, which is zero, greater than zero, and then less of these two, which is 
Okay. So therefore now this integral becomes almost trivial. So becomes zero one minus z dy then z over one minus z. So that integral just throw you one factor of one minus z, which is canceling this denominator factor. So basically the integral is dz of z, which is m. Okay. I mean I'm sure you can do this, but I just want to show that there's non-trivial business about the uh, limit of integration. When you have integral with deltas and delos. Okay, they have to keep track of all of that. Therefore, we learn the following. The G from uh, a, a loop correction is two plus two times this. And then what we have learned is that two times this thing, evaluated into zero, gives me alpha over pi times f. So it's two plus alpha over two. So if you evaluate numerically using the measurement of alpha at low energy, or like one over one third seven, this is numerically two point zero zero two three two and so on. And then there's a part of measurement, and then obviously, now well, it agrees very well. One of the success, greatest success in the history of science. Okay. It's not, we're not talking about percent. We're not talking about 0.1%. We're talking about crazy level of precision that agrees easy by easy. Okay, so uh, probably we have to stop here. Next time we will talk about the math renormalization of the electron self image diagram. That, that, that will be the last bit of the uh, diagram we need to look at to uh, finish the renormalization. In the last class, we will combine everything together to talk about. We normalize for the vision theory and checks the uh, work and cash identity that we, we alluded a long time ago. Okay, that's that's all for today.